Paul Gillian with Backcountry Discovery Routes. We're here in New Mexico creating the sixth Backcountry Discovery Route. So our group met at Sandia BMW. So some of us uh, got there, had service done, picked up a few last minute things. So they're a great jumping off point or meeting point to start Backcountry Discovery Route in New Mexico. We're so proud to have you guys down here and we're thrilled. Uh, we're looking forward to all the BDR riders that are coming here now and in the future. We've got four full-time techs back there. Three of them are master techs. We take great pride in our reputation for, for servicing travelers. I'm Rob Watt and uh, I've been with the Backcountry Discovery Routes for about four years now. Uh, I'm kind of the head scout master, I guess. I, I do all the scouting and also play the role of uh, EMT and, and medical for our, our team. Hi, I'm John Beck. I'm the photographer for the New Mexico BDR and I'm really excited to be on this trip because I've heard a lot about the route and uh, given I'm coming off an injury and this is my first ride since, I'm looking forward to doing a relatively mellow BDR compared to what we've done in the past. I just got back from scouting the New Mexico BDR. This is the fifth BDR that I've done and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with the team and with our audience. This year on the New Mexico BDR, we have four newbies or four new people that we invited on the trip this year. We have Court Butler and uh, Shalmarie Wilson and um, Kevin Woody and Roger Patterson. And so it was kind of fun to have a new group uh, in there and, and have a new dynamic. I'm gonna offset all the Germans in the group with an Austrian. Court Butler, the B in Butler Maps. My business partner, Justin Bradshaw, had been one of the core members of the BDR group. And since um, he just keeps making babies, he was indisposed for this trip. So I took his place, and um, he's going to be hard pressed to get his, his place back. My name's Roger Pattison, and I am a, a native of New Mexico. I grew up in the east part of New Mexico, where it's flat and the wind blows. I'm Shelmarie Wilson, and I've been on the BDRs for the last three months. I'm looking forward to having another BDR to do, um, since I've done the rest of them. Hi, my name is Kevin Whitty, and I'm based out of Seattle, Washington. What brings me to the BDR and the program is I believe strongly in trying to keep and maintain roads and trails throughout uh, the various states in the U.S. to allow us to do uh, the writing that we're all so passionate about. So the New Mexico BDR starts down in Dell City, Texas. It's about 1290 miles, 80% dirt and 20% uh, pavement. I just love traveling in New Mexico. It's something new every time you go around a corner. It's every time you see a new road you think I wonder where that goes, and, and if uh, you have some time and some energy and a little adventure, some spirit, you'll go find out. So there's a lot of things to, to see and do as you get to the beginning of the New Mexico BDR. We went through Roswell, that's a little community that's known for its UFO sightings, and they have a whole UFO culture built around that town. Um, after that, Sitting Bull Falls is a really relaxing, refreshing stop on the way to the beginning. Right before you get to Dell City coming in from the east, you actually have an opportunity to go through the highest point in Texas. And as you're going over this hill, if you look up to your right, you'll see Guadalupe Peak, and that's the highest point in Texas. If you're going to the start of the New Mexico BDR from Albuquerque, you'll probably be going down the interstate, which is just a long run down a highway. What's so deceiving about New Mexico is that people travel here and, and travel through the state and go on the interstates and almost the only thing they see is desert. And I hope that motorcycle travel in the backcountry will offer people a better opportunity where they can see some of the most beautiful parts of our state. Found a really cool campground but we got there a little late. And it was closed, so now we've settled for a strange little place that there's no one at, but there's a little ticket you can fill out and put two bucks in and you can camp. So can't argue with the price. So tomorrow we've got uh, 70 miles to Dell, where we'll be for a little bit, and we'll be in the dirt.
Two months prior to this trip, I actually got hit by a car in LA. Um, I was commuting on a bike and classic statistics thing, a car turned left in front of me and fortunately the only thing that happened is I, I broke both uh, my kneecaps. I'm really sore because my legs have atrophied so it's a bit difficult to walk and I just got off crutches last week so the whole walking thing is a little bit new to me still. But uh, you know, I'm riding around on a 1200cc wheelchair so it helps, you know, you don't have to make too much effort to cruise around so I'd rather do this than you know, I can sit at home being broken or I can be out here camping and doing rehab and I'd rather do this. All right, here we are in El City, start of the uh, New Mexico BDR. This is our first stop. We're going to get some gas, get a little uh, food, and then hit the dirt. Come along. Del City, Texas is just a small agricultural town. There's two gas stations and there's a little grocery store, convenience store. We gathered there, had some of the best gas station fried chicken in the world. Then we hit the road for the uh, beginning of the New Mexico BDR. So as soon as you get out of Del City, you hit the first dirt. It's like right outside of town. It's just wide open flat land with a gravel road so you can really get in your dirt riding mode. You can go fast, you can just feel the back end sliding around on the gravel, but it's a great uh, introduction to the start of the BDR. Texas has a lot more money for their roads and highways, so they can pave and improve roads where New Mexico is unable to. The first taste of sand was uh, kind of gripping, <laughs> um, very deep and very sudden. But I got through it and kept it upright, so I'm pretty happy about that. I try not to worry about things until I actually see for myself. When I do too much thinking, I totally psych myself out. So riding with more experienced riders, I think, is great for me. Because um, I'm definitely curious about what my limitations are and where my, where my level really is. Dog Canyon and Guadalupe Ram are some of the most arid and barren parts of our state, but they're starkly beautiful in that barrenness. And it's one of the few places in the route where we have the cobbly gravel and ch big, bigger, chunkier rocks all over the road. They're just, it's just littered with it, and every time they grade the roads, they stir them up and spread them out, and so you get these windrows in the middle of the road and on the sides, and it can be treacherous, and that's the funny thing about riding in New Mexico. It's so beautiful that you want to stop all the time and look because if you, if you try to look and ride, you're bound to drive off the road. I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, some of the guys said it was an easier route, uh, but having never been to New Mexico, I didn't really know what to expect. I thought it would be kind of arid, uh, maybe similar to Utah or Arizona. And I was just looking forward to getting to know the state. You come out of Crow Flats and you enter Big Dog Canyon, which is like this really wide, open expanse with cool vegetation and desert landscape all around you. And then up on the left, you can see Guadalupe Rim as you're riding along. It wasn't a very direct route. We really kind of squirmed around, went south, and then got up on this rim. And uh, the rain held off. And conditions were pretty good and it was a great first day. You're basically going to come around El Paso Gap, do a hairpin curve and go up on the top of Guadalupe Rim and you get these sweeping views for hundreds of miles to the left. Once you get to the top there, um, you're pretty much heading northwest and just commanding views all the way west. So take some time if you have some time to, to check out the, the numerous viewpoints because they're just spectacular. There's some fun twisties on the way here. We got to this gas station with a gravel parking lot and gas pumps that look like they're from 7-Eleven from the 1980s. So weed is the first place to get gas. There's uh, a, a small general store and a gas station. Weed is population 22, and it's a great place to visit and a great place to live. What do you think, boss? Potatoes, onions, we got pork chops. We could barbecue pork chops. 
some of these smaller convenience stores slash gas stations, it's a challenge sometimes. It gets a little stressed when, you know, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> what's everybody going to eat or not. But myself, I sort of think about what's the easiest thing to be able to prepare for eight people um, with the least amount of equipment. Kevin took the bar and just raised it right up here because we had I would say not gourmet meals, but for cooking on the side of the road with uh, what we can carry in our motorcycles, he really stepped it up. Uh, tonight we were having uh, bratwurst. We're doing fried potatoes oh, with uh, corn with uh, red and green peppers. And for later, we are going to attempt to do cinnamon rolls on the barbecue. <laughs> yeah. This is fun, you guys. <laughs> Cheers to everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Love y'all. Good people. So on the second day, we woke up and we didn't get very far because we hit mud. And it was some sticky, greasy, slippery, wet, chocolate mud. difference right there boys. Sometimes size does matter. Small bikes make it a little easier to paddle through that stuff. That's some wicked stuff there. <laughs> Into the fender. Yeah. That's a good workout. Go. <laughs> Woo! We've only been riding about 30 minutes. I think we've covered a half mile or so. The mud is just like it was in Utah where it's pretty much unridable. So we've just made the, the decision to turn around. We're going to head back and take some asphalt around this section and let the mud dry up a little bit rather than fighting it with eight bikes. So that's what we did, got on the pavement and went around and reconnected with the route on the west side road. The west side road is really cool because it's a gravel road that winds its way along the edge of the mountains, Lincoln National Forest to your right and White Sands off to your left. And it's just a, a picturesque high ridge that you're riding along with sweeping views to the left and it's just pure fun. So if we would have stayed on that road this morning, would we have come out here? Yeah, we would have been right on this road coming out. If you look in the distance, uh, you'll see part of the white sand out there. I think I can see your house from here, Rob. <laughs> look at that, that's gorgeous. Yeah. So on the way to Cloudcroft, uh, you might want to stop at the Apple Barn. It's kind of a little tourist attraction on the side of the road, but it's been there since the 40s. It's a place where you can Stop in for a, a treat. Uh, there's lots of uh, fresh apple pies and apple cider and that kind of thing. And the ladies that work there are just wonderful. They, they alone make your, your stop at the Apple Barn worthwhile. The Apple Barn was built um, originally for the apples of the area, but this area was the most famous apple growing place west of the Mississippi for years. And um, so it's fun to, to um, share the apples and, and all the joy. We get a lot of business, but Thanks for stopping in, we appreciate it. We get people from everywhere. After you uh, fill up on sweets and sugar and caffeine at the Apple Barn, go to Cloudcroft. Cloudcroft is a really cool little uh, high elevation community. It's like 9,000 feet of elevation. And it's, it's a neat little community. They've got a few Western bars. So you could go to the saloon, you could stay at one of the old hotels, or I might even recommend that you stay at the old lodge that uh, it's known to be haunted by the ghost of Rebecca. So this key holds the passage up the stairway to get up to the top of the tower where Rebecca supposedly is haunting it. Um, Clark Gable and Judy Garland both carved their names into one section of the wall up there. In the bar room of the old lodge is Al Capone's bar. 
This bar was shipped to New Mexico from Chicago, and rumor has it that this is an actual bullet hole in the bottom of the bar. Whatever you do, stop in Cloudcroft, uh, check out some of the things that they have to offer in that cool little town, and, and then uh, head out on the BDR from there. So after you leave Cloudcroft, uh, you get on the dirt right away, and it's, it's cool riding through the forest. I don't know how well you can see this on the helmet camera, but this is a pretty rough, rutted out section. If you get caught in one of those ruts the wrong way, it might be tough to get out. But also, sometimes you have to hit them like at 90 degrees with a little bit of momentum to get, to get through so that neither one of your wheels gets stuck. It starts to get a little challenging. There's some technical sections with some ruts in the road and some loose rocks. We rode some roads that were, despite being very rocky, uh, they had just tremendous flow, just flowing back and forth, lots of corners, very tight. Uh, it was more technical riding. It felt almost like doing an enduro or something on the big bike, so it was a really fun section. The last road we just did was fantastic. It had really good flow. They had just graded it. It was just like kind of a roller coaster going through the woods. A lot of fun. Now we're out in the open a little more. We're climbing up. There's this red rock road surface. It's really smooth. It's great. As long as it's not wet, it's fantastic. At this point, you get back on the pavement and you're heading north to Rio Doso. And it's pretty much just a pavement ride to get there. Um, there's the, the Mescalero Indian Reservation that you go through. And then part of that is the Inn of the Mountain Gods Casino. You can certainly stop in there and maybe win some money and uh, fund your next BDR adventure. So Rio Doso is just a place to get some fuel, some supplies, head north, keep going. You get back into the back country and you come up past Bonita Lake Reservoir. So as we were heading into Carrizoso, the sky just got black in front of us and we could see a storm off in the distance. Here in Carrizoso, Malpies. Malpies are 44 miles long, 6 miles wide. It's a big lava flow that started about 10 miles north of the highway. We went to the Valley of Fires Recreation Area and stayed in the campground there. And that's really cool because it's right on the edge of the lava beds. The route goes directly to the west through these lava beds. And that campsite, they've got good facilities there. There's a knoll that you can hike up to the top of and get a really expansive view of the area around there. Carrizozo is a really cool little farming and ranching community, but their old downtown is kind of cool. They have some antique stores and some art galleries. There was one really nice coffee shop that was there, and the, the lady running it was, was really sweet. She was grateful to have our business and told us all about the history of the town. After we had uh, some pastries and coffee, we went, went across town and met her husband, who runs the local motorcycle, little independent motorcycle shop. They were just excited about the BDR coming through their town and I think they're going to be great supporters of it and uh, give us motorcyclists a great destination to go to on the way through. Well, uh, you know, it's it, there's kind of a love-hate relationship with living in a rural town. You know, you love it when the things are going good, you hate it when you have to go to the doctor 100 miles away. <laughs> but it is an interesting place to live. and. Uh, it's to the mountains, you know, and uh, for Flatlanders, it <laughs> gives you a whole different perspective on life. <laughs> Look for all of the painted mules that are around town. That was an art project that they did uh, where they 
made a bunch of mules and had different people paint them in different designs and different colors and they're spread throughout the city so you could actually drive around town and try to find all the different painted mules. There's not just these here on 12th Street, there's that the uh, visitor center to caboose our town hall and several other places within the community. <laughs> if you live here, it's, you're, it's, it's unusual. <laughs> oh. If you drive by, oh, it's unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the morning after we left uh, Carrizoso, we got on the dirt and we do this fantastic loop to the north of the pavement and it, it reconnects with the pavement about 30 miles later. But to me, this is like where the really fun, scenic, good desert riding kicks in. That was about a 40 mile remote section, pretty much a, a two track just through some amazing country looking exactly like the Serengeti or that, you know, there's the ecosystem is like a savanna. Then you're back on the pavement for a short stretch and heading down to the White Sands uh, area. What do you think of the sand? Um, I, I think it's, it's fine. It, for me, it's easier than walking, so I'm kind of liking it. But also, I mean, you know, these bikes are pretty intense. All of us have uh, modern dual sports. They've got insane amounts of braking. So I'm just keeping an eye on it, and if I see something that looks dicey, I chop the throttle and slow down, and these things will stop really quick. Yep. So the trick is scrub your speed before you hit the deep sand. Otherwise, you end up scrubbing your speed with your body flying over the bars. I just attempted walking without crutches about a week before I arrived here in New Mexico to start the BDR. And fortunately being on a boxer, I could stick my legs up on the cylinder, I could change position, I could do all these things that to a certain degree mimicked the physical therapy that I would have to do anyway. Well, the doc had me doing leg raises like this for PT. So, and also uh, bending 90 degree and beyond. So I'd do that, do a few leg raises, Relax for a bit. Maybe try some stair step squats. Like I say, this motorcycle, it's a full gym, plus a high octane wheelchair. Adventure rehab. <laughs> well, and this is one of the sections in the BDR that uh, will test your sand riding. This road's been maintained recently, and so they've scraped off the, the deeper sand, at least in places. But uh, with these big heavy bikes, it's definitely a word of caution. There's plenty of opportunities to slip and slide and, and fall over, but it wasn't horrible, deep, treacherous sand. It, for the most part, we could go pretty fast, but it was, it was remote and there was no shade. It was just really hot. We stopped on the side of the road at one point to take a break and eat some food and drink some water and it, we were just getting cooked in an oven. So, uh, you know, as you go through the white sands, just make sure that you're, that you're supplied, that you have water, and, you know, if something happens, you're gonna be pretty exposed baking out there in the desert heat. We have never had someone with a parasol on the, uh, on the BDR. This is, I mean, seriously, it makes a difference for Sh me anyway. Shell, you're all right. Your, your <laughs> thumbs up in my book nice. right now. <laughs> wow. There's dogfight practice. It's top gun. Look at that. Roger, tell, tell, us what, what, tell us what's significant about this area. Well, the reason that we had to go all the way around to the north and now we're headed back south is because right here to our south at the moment is the White Sands Missile Range specifically Trinity site where they blew off the first atomic bomb. Do you, so your, do your relatives remember when they did the big bomb? Yeah. Wow. I mean, the ones, I, none of them are living. They yeah. Were here, but, but you yeah, heard they, the stories? Were, yeah, yeah. From your parents or grandparents? Uh, uncles and grandparents. Wow. Yeah. Uncles rode up there a few days later. 
they ended up with no ears, no nose, and you know, I guess from the radiation, they, really? they didn't know anything, you know. Oh, how horrible. We've got a big lightning cell right ahead of us. Paul, Kevin, and I are riding, and we just keep seeing strikes right in front of us. Literally, the first one I saw, I don't know why it mattered, but I sat down. Uh, but we're going to try to blast through the storm and see. Not all eight of us can get struck, so someone's going to have to take the fall for that one. So you're following this fence line for probably 30 miles. Then you take this hard right, and now you're in this mud bog. And in my scene headset, I hear this, don't be a hero. <laughs> At the same time, I'm doing a Barodi. I think we should give Kevin a new nickname. Let's call him the geologist because he keeps taking mud samples and dirt samples all the way through the state of New Mexico. <laughs> Look at his elbow. Show him your elbow. Dirt sample number one. Dirt sample number two. The good news dirt is he fell over on three. his left side so he didn't yeah. the relic. Mud on the inside of your fairing. Yeah, it was muddy back there. Yeah, sand is better than mud. <laughs> I guess the conclusion would be $40 we spent at the car wash trying to blast all that mud out of the bike. It was a, like 98 degrees when we got to Truth or Consequences, or as the locals call it, T or C. The name Truth or Consequences is kind of an interesting story, but back in the 50s there was a game show called Truth or Consequences. The producers of the game show made an offer that they would give a certain amount of money to any community that changed their name to Truth or Consequences. So the city of Hot Springs, New Mexico decided to go for it and now they're known as Truth or Consequences. You know there's a lot of retired people there but a lot of people go there just for um, uh, just to kind of rejuvenate and there's kind of boutique little uh, hotels and, or motels around that are kind of old that have been uh, redone and so it's kind of cool. There's a lot of natural hot spring activity in this area, and because of that, there's about a dozen little hot spring resorts, motels, um, places that have you know, basically t turned that into a business. And it, it's kind of cool because you have a wide spectrum of, of these little hot springs resorts that are available. Some of them are just like little sketchy almost motels on the side of the road advertising their hot springs all the way up to one of them that, which was actually on the Rio Grande River and you can sit in a hot spring pool overlooking the Rio Grande and really nice facilities so if you're interested in, in that kind of thing um, that's a really great place to do that. Where we stayed was really cool which was just north of there in Elephant Butte. Elephant Butte Reservoir is an amazing project. It was done to create irrigation water for all the, the agriculture in the area. It created a really nice lake. It's used for recreation. There's sailboats here, motor bo boats. There's RVs camping right on the shore. They dump off their jet skis out of their boat and they just spend the weekend out here. So it's got a lot of recreation possibilities. To get to that location was challenging. It was the deepest sand um, that I've ever dealt with. Thumbs up. Didn't go down. <laughs> it was great for us because we'd been riding in the heat. It was 95 degrees yesterday and we pulled in and we were able to go jump in the lake, do some swimming and really cool off. It's uh, dispersed camping anywhere on shore so uh, you know, if you're camping, that is absolutely the place to stop. Once you leave Truth or Consequences, it's perfect pavement, sweeping corners. We're heading towards the mountains where you're gonna be in the mountains for a long time. And if you look off to the north, there's this expansive view where there's just little mountains here and there. And they're, they're, they were probably volcanic at some point because the whole the state seems to be that way. 
you get into this like grassland pastoral area where there's horses and cows and you go higher and higher and you end up in the little town of Winston. The Winston General Store is really cool. It's like the, uh, the guns and groceries store. You could probably buy any type of gun you wanted in there. They even have pink handguns for sale, like right next to the register. What's hunted up here the most? Is it right elk? Right now it's elk. Elk, elk yeah. Elk's going. Elk bow is going right now. Elk and deer, uh, mule deer is big here. Uh, then we'll go from that to deer again for rifle and elk for rifle. And then we have bear, javelina, mountain lion, turkey, a little bit of everything. Here. What they really cater to are the hunters in the area. And so they do a lot of camping. And so it's a great spot to stop if you need supplies uh, for, your, for your trip and camping and food. And we were able to get some great stuff and make a great dinner. So from Winston, um, it's only about two miles up to Chloride, uh, which is an old mining town that they mined silver years ago there. The guy that runs the town, and he can give you a fantastic tour in the museum and show you um, all the different historical artifacts and photographs and the stories that go behind this, this little community. Built in 1880, closed in 1923, sealed up with boards and tin all the doors and windows and was left closed up for 73 years. In 1923 they sent the young son back east to be educated and uh, he was supposed to get an education as a businessman and come back. So to save this for him they sealed it up with boards and tin, all the doors and windows with everything left in it, all the food stuff even. Everything you see in that store is as it was when the original owner left to go back east and, and so somehow it remained in that state to the present day where now it's open and it's a museum. It's a fascinating place to walk into a time capsule and see all that stuff. We had made the decision to go ahead and try Chloride Canyon, uh, which is part of the route. It's uh, what we would consider an intermediate plus or advanced part of the route. Uh, sometimes Chloride Canyon actually is in really good shape and uh, you can take big bikes through it, which I had done back in June. Uh, it was fantastic and I'm thinking, wow, this is gonna be a great section for the route. Um, the Chloride Creek Road it is pretty exciting and it, it goes through the creek over a hundred times. You're gonna be getting wet. And you're gonna be doing a lot of creek crossings. There's been a lot of heavy rains and some flooding through there, which has uh, washed out a lot of the road, made it very difficult to go up through. I'm definitely using my skid plate right now. <laughs> I could hear it. The roads here, when they have flash floods and heavy rains, the roads can just get blown out altogether and become totally unrideable. Holy smokes, look at this. I guess we just go right up the river at this point, huh? There was the option of taking the road or the, the creek, and I wasn't sure what I was going to choose um, until I was in it. I mean, that's stuff I would do on my dirt bike, no problem. Um, but to to tackle it with my my GS, um, I think that was my favorite, just because I felt accomplished afterwards. Like, wow, I was able to do that. So. Sterling actually had a pretty significant get off that demonstrates that even someone with a lot of experience who's already ridden it, you can still get bit. Oh, Jesus! Whoa, whoa. Oh, shit. I hope he's. I think it's, it's those open. times um, of adversity that pull the group together. And those are also the experiences that, that you walk away from. You may not like it at the time, but you walk away from it and you say, this is, this is, that was awesome. We kind of decided out of the uh, caution of not uh, injuring anyone or a bike uh, that, you know, we got to see the canyon and it obviously has had some washouts. So we're turning around and to ride it another day. So we do have an alternate route if you don't want to go up Chloride Canyon. That's an absolutely incredible pavement ride up through the uh, mountains to get back onto dirt. If you go on that pavement route, you'll see a sign that says no services for the next 121 miles. And there are no services. Uh, and you don't see too many people. It's the only road through there that goes through, and that's why you're on pavement. But this is a G2 uh, or G1 uh, rated uh, road. And I mean, it's twisty and curves and up and down and undulating. And it's really fun.
This is a really special part of the route because it gets really, really remote. You know that it's going to be a special ride and that you're going to be out there in the backcountry seeing the true backcountry. That was no joke. I mean, we were out there for over a day with no stores, no gas, no water. It, uh, it was a really long section. One thing you've already seen is mud. And if you haven't seen mud, you're going to see mud in New Mexico unless you get extremely lucky and it's a really dry spot. The mud uh, can sneak up on you, and when it does, it is like grease, and you don't see it coming. This is um, a particularly sticky kind of dirt, and so we want to be really careful too when you're here because it'll ball up on your tires, and some of these bikes with really low fenders have a tendency to uh, lock up the front wheel. Hey, I need a stick. This isn't doing anything. I had friends that got stuck out like this, and they uh, didn't have, they weren't camping, and they all had to sleep because they burned out two clutches, oh. and so they had to uh, sleep outside. And they took gasoline out of one of the bikes to start a fire. And they all slept in their clothes and their helmets to stay warm. Part of the real adventure and pleasure, I think, of doing this sort of ride, yeah, ride is that you get to a situation like this and, and you do exactly what we're doing. You just sit it out and wait. Even if it was later and came to the point you just set up camp, you could wait it out and it would change. Unless the prediction is more rain, then it could get worse. But it's a, the right attitude on a, on a backcountry discovery route adventure is to just take it as it comes, get through it the best way you can, rely on your friends, be prepared. Have fun. Well, on this trip, you want to make sure that you really plan for that. When you get to a town, make sure you have enough water for at least 24 hours, and you have plenty of food, and that you have all the tools to get through. Because if it rains, you can get stuck for uh, more than 24 hours out there, and there are really no services for a long ways. So we camped at Snow Lake. It was a great campground with this high bluff looking above this alpine lake. There was a creek we had to cross to get there. It was really nice. What was really great about uh, Snow Lake is that uh, we had another place to go swimming. Uh, we went down to the boat ramp. You didn't have any traction, but the water was cold. This trip is kind of off the couch for me. I, I've never done anything that's just camping, you know, nine days in a row. And so that's one of the benefits, in my opinion, about a trip this length. You get to immerse yourself into it, and a lot of the other noise of your life kind of gets stripped away. Being halfway done, it's like, okay, not ready for it to end, but I'm just looking forward to what's ahead. I, you know, I hear it even gets even better, which is hard to imagine. ride down into reserve is about a 51 mile ride that traversed quite a few different ecosystems. We slowly dropped down out of the you know different deciduous forests around there and wound our way through some canyons and ended up um, coming into this little sleepy town of reserve. Reserve's a great little town when you come into it because they've got two gas stations. They've got a, a little uh, cafe named Ella's. It's a great little stop after being uh, in the backcountry for uh, about 150 miles. More times than not, there's usually a couple of locals sitting there and uh, we get to chit-chatting with them as we do our refueling. And How long have you been sitting here this morning? Yeah. Well, tell, tell them what you told me, what you, why, you're, why we're sitting here. Well, that's all the benches now. <laughs> they walk away. The they benches. walk off and walk off. The what? The benches walk away if we don't sit here. And oh. So got a... they, they've got an important role here, is uh, keeping, keeping these benches from walking away. 
careful. Watch those benches. Once you leave Reserve, we go up on uh, Pueblo Park Road, which goes up into the San Francisco mountains. And it's really cool because all of a sudden you're climbing really high and uh, you're able to see over into Arizona, into the mountains of Arizona. And um, if you're lucky, when you get to the highest point, uh, if you look up to the right, you'll see some cliff dwellings up on the, up on the mountain. And then you continue along that uh, road and you get to a point where you can go dip your toes into Arizona so you can say you've been in Texas, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, and Colorado on this trip. The last dirt road we were running on, Kevin and I were chatting, we were coming around an uphill loose corner and we were just commenting on how loose it was and dangerous it could be if someone was going too fast and then all of a sudden I heard him scream and moan and uh, he had uh, he had ended up hitting a deer. That deer is pretty smart. He somehow eluded all the hunters out there this weekend, but uh, he didn't elude Kevin's F-800. I hit him, I think, in the rib cage. Yeah, and the eye and the bike went over the top of him, and I took all of the brunt on my shoulder and slid off my head. He definitely has a broken collarbone. It's possible that he even has a broken rib. That's where we're at right now. Um, we're going to decide how we're going to get him uh, to a hospital uh, or back to Albuquerque. And uh, uh, he's actually in a lot more pain than he let on when we first, uh, when I first got to him. He was saying his pain level was about a three. And uh, when I just examined him again and hit the right spot, um, uh, it kind of uh, set his pain level a little higher. No, I think that's the most right. disappointing yeah. thing I've probably ever had to do, buddy. Yeah, well, I knew that. It's pretty sad. Something like that, you know, there's no way you could be prepared for. Um, so, it just, uh, it's upsetting, you know, it's unsettling. It just, you, you know, you never want to see a friend of yours get hurt. Probably have to go to the hospital and get things taken care of and uh, make sure nothing's too badly broken or ripped up. And... These uh, people are cannibalizing my bags right now for all of the goodies. <laughs> so I wish them luck. <laughs> Here's all the coffee. Don't lose that. Not the coffee. Saying goodbye to Kevin was really hard, actually. I even told him if we could trade places, I would. You know, I just really felt bad. Kevin's a trooper. He's one of the toughest dudes I've met. He literally got back on that bike and rode out. He was able to load his bike up into the truck and he's uh, safely on his way home. One thing you need to really be aware of leaving Luna is whether or not it's rained north of there. So um, if you do see that there has been a big storm that's gone through there, then maybe you want to take the pavement around that section. As you get north of um, Luna and you get out of the Gila National Forest, you get into some ranch land, which is kind of what people think of New Mexico as, because if you travel down I-40, you know, you see these big expansive uh, plains and that's what you get into. But it is beautiful uh, pasture lands and, and bluffs off in the distance and, and uh, who knows, you might even see some wild horses. We got into some sections here that you felt like just no one traveled these roads other than a few ranchers. There was a couple of ranches out there, but it was so remote. Just beautiful, you know, wild west landscapes. You, you, really, there was cattle gates and cows and a couple of ranch houses that we saw in like a three hour stretch. It was incredibly remote. You got a smile on your face, that's good. Of course, <laughs> we're on a BDR. We decided to ride late. Uh, and we came into the little town of Fence Lake. And right in the middle of Fence Lake is their community center. And we're sitting there kind of deciding what to do. And I kind of looked over to the right and I saw these picnic tables and we pulled around back and they had come to find out they had two uh, por porta potties or outhouses back there and it actually made a great camp. There was a little playground back there and we pitched our tents underneath the swing sets, built a little barbecue uh, fire 
and uh, made our fifth night on the BDR uh, behind the uh, Fence Lake Community Center. When you leave Fence Lake, uh, you get onto uh, another dirt road, and then all of a sudden um, you'll notice that the gravel changes from a white gravel to a cinder cone gravel or a dark uh, black gravel, and that's when you know you're on the Zuni Reservation. You'll travel through that for quite a while. Uh, you'll come up to Candy Kitchen. Well, this was a candy store out here. Well, do you believe that? Out in the middle of no place in the late 40s, 50s, a candy store? No, but we made moonshine, <laughs> like a lot of places. It's, it's an interesting area, and it's a, an area you have to come in and, and be here a few days to enjoy its beauty. All right, guys, so we got a text message from Kevin Woody. It says, hi, guys, midnight, and the tests are coming in. Looks like a cracked clavicle, so a collarbone, two cracked ribs, and possibly a torn rotator cuff. Uh, I'm going to drive up tomorrow to Seattle to get the cup looked at uh, before too much additional damage can take place. So, sounds like he's going to get in his truck and drive to Seattle. Like we thought, he has some yeah. serious injuries yeah. and he won't be rejoining us for sure. Hopefully he can get uh, to a doctor and hopefully the rotator cuff's not a major tear. Yeah. They, they can be a pretty ugly injury. Never lost his sense of humor in the midst of it all either. No. No, he's got a great attitude. Really, he's always positive, even when he's laying on the ground with a broken bike and a torn rotator cuff. So if you don't buy groceries in Candy Kitchen, you can buy groceries at Pine Hill, which is on the uh, Zuni Reservation. Um, and then you travel through the Zuni some more to the north, and then we're back into the National Forest, which I believe is the Cibola, Cibola National Forest. That road starts off kind of wide and gravelly, and it get continually uh, gets narrower, and then we cut off onto a really, really cool two-track. It was like a luge run the whole time. There was bank turns and pine trees, and we had enough cloud cover that it wasn't hot, so the temperature was perfect. And opened up all the vents and the climb stuff, you get a good breeze going, it was just a, an epic day. It's amazing you can be on a 600 pound, 1200 cc motorcycle with all your camping gear and to be riding just this flowy trail, it's like you're a little kid on a dirt bike in there, it is so much fun. I think Shal uh, maybe had as much fun as I did on that section because she was right on my heels there. That was phenomenal, that's my favorite. Sing or a double track on these bikes, I love it and the break point in the mountains there was some old mine shaft they had put a grate on and Rob almost fell three inches to his death which was pretty funny he stepped off this ledge that was about three inches and didn't realize there was another step there and, and I had to go over there and put on my knees and let my heart get back to normal rhythm because it was it was scary but it's a long ways down there and it looks like the shaft goes back that way but it's kind of cool that you can look over it Grants is on I-40. It's a great place to, if you want to stay in motels, uh, they've got great restaurants. Uh, there's some grocery stores, obviously, uh, and just a good place to kind of catch a breath and, and then get ready for the next section, which is a long section of really remote uh, roads. The best thing about the Backcountry Discovery Route organization is getting people out into the backcountry to see things they've maybe never experienced before. And we have literally seen five or six completely and totally different ecosystems and environments. And all the way from, I think our the highest temperature we saw was 103. And we were traveling yesterday in, in some a uh, little better than 50 degree weather. That's a lot of difference and a lot of changes in nine days. It's really cool to go through those transitions where you're up high in the mountains and the forests and you gradually start to come down out of that into something completely different. All of a sudden you feel like you're in a totally different state and you're actually just a few miles down the road. 
New Mexico is much more expansive views. You feel like you're in the scene of a Western movie. It's really a true piece of the American West. One thing about this part of the route is this is also the one section that we do that is the same as the Continental Divide Trail. From when we leave uh, Grants and we get almost to Cuba, we're on the same as the Continental Divide Trail. The landscape is incredible. There's old volcanoes everywhere. There's uh, buttes and uh, mountains, and, and then there's sand, lots of sand. The group had a tough time getting through them. There was a lot of uh, dropped bikes. There were a lot of people really fishtailing and dabbing, and I know I hit my shin on my cylinder a couple of times. I've been semi-successful, but um, I've actually laid it down a few times too, so I guess that's part of the learning curve, and just keep at it. One of the great things I like about riding a BDR is, is you spend, you know, eight hours in the saddle every day riding and a lot of off-road and so you just get better and better each day you just really you can practice tricks and techniques that you know all day long and you just get so much better by the end of the trip you're just a phenomenal rider compared to how you started so somewhere between grants and cuba you come across this old ranch with a corral just out in the middle of nowhere and it's a cool place to stop and just reflect on the past and who might have lived out here. And They still probably use those crows. Matter of fact, I'm sure they do. Uh, so, you know, go take a look at it, but don't be climbing on things and stuff. Just really uh, respect so we can still travel through this area. This has been a great team. We've, we've overcome any difficulties. We've overcome any, any small personality conflicts that may have occurred and just and just work together to get through and I can't tell you what a sense of accomplishment this feels like to be sitting here today having gained these folks confidence having been able to to see them personally experience the beauty and the rich heritage of New Mexico. I watched carefully and watched closely and, and inquired with all of the people on the trip each day about their experiences and I watched their love for New Mexico be created by, and born and grow and mature over the last nine days. They have come to appreciate a part of this United States that they didn't even realize existed. This is one of the better campsites uh, that we've had. We're perched up on a bluff, almost sombrero looking mountain structures off in the distance. One of the best camp spots that I can remember. I keep saying that it's like, how are we gonna beat this location? And we seem to do that. So yeah, it keeps me looking forward to what's next. You're pretty smoked from the day. You're hot, you're sweaty, you're dirty, but I'm so tired at the end of each day, it's just, you're done. Just after we had left our camp, Chow started off and she started off okay and then all of a sudden she took a quick fall. Then um, we got her up and she's going and kind of got the best of her and she went right into a, into the bank. It looked like she, she said, I think I popped my ACL. I had surgery a year ago and I heard a pop and I think I've heard it again. I had to dab pretty hard and it, it uh, kind of woke up my, my bad knee. So it's kind of, uh, I'm feeling it, and so I'm timid now and not really riding how I should be, and um, it's not helping. And when you, get in that, when you get in that mindset, it makes it even harder to ride. You know, but that sand, like I was telling you, wasn't like that when I scouted it. And certain times of the year, when it gets hotter, the sand gets 
worse and when it's a little cooler the sand's not as hard to ride through so yeah. you just never know when you come through New Mexico or any of the states uh, what the sand conditions are going to be like sometimes it's easy sometimes it's a struggle and we all struggled through it it was tough just super frustrated that I can't ride like I want to be riding right now and uh, trying to get over it and I'm I'm now over my tantrum um, and it looks like we're about out of the sand which is good news for me but then she rode the rest of the trip with what we think is probably a, a t torn ACL again um, and which good God I would have cried un uncle uh, you know five miles out of that so uh, that's that's pretty tough to be able to do that. So after you leave Cuba, you come into the Santa Fe National Forest. The road up there is a nice gravel road. Uh, you're starting to climb up uh, quite a bit higher. Um, you come by a place called Tea Kettle Rock, which is kind of a cool little uh, rock that's out in the middle of nowhere and uh, has a unique shape. Then we drop back down onto the highway and, and head into um, towards Abiquiu. Uh, when you get to the lake there, and there's a dam you cross, and right as soon as you cross the dam, you're gonna make a really hard uh, right in a U-turn, and you're gonna switch back down uh, down the dam, which is really uh, kind of fun, and, and it's a great paved road. You can kind of really hang, hang in there. Then you ride right along the river uh, on this dirt road. It's not very long, it's pretty short, but it's, it's really scenic and you get some nice views of the river and you're riding along the river for a ways. Rumor had it that there was a big film being produced and shot uh, around Abiquiu. So we go down and we see some big grip trucks and uh, we come around the corner and there's a big old security guard there. And sure enough, he stopped us and said, uh, There's a motion picture coming up. Well, what's it? What is it? Which one? I can't actually say. Oh, come on. It's the Dirty Dozen. Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven. There you go. <laughs> We're the Magnificent Seven today. Yeah. You guys yeah. actually... <laughs> We're missing number eight. Right. So we are the Magnificent Seven. You look up the river and it's just like turning the clock back 200 years because they built all these old buildings and there's horses all over and... Uh, and you, you could, looking through my long lens, I could see people in period clothes and obviously between takes, you know, because you got guys wandering around in, in regular, you know, street clothes like this, and then you got people in 1800s wear, it looked like. So they were clearly filming something out there, and it was really interesting. Abiquiu is a really cool town. It's a very historic um, town uh, for a number of reasons, but one of the, the interesting things about Abiquiu is that. This is a, a, a town where Georgia O'Keeffe, the famous painter, uh, had one of her homes. She lived in this area of New Mexico and she painted here. This is one of the more recognizable towns in northern New Mexico. It's, part of that is from the, um, the Spanish Franciscan monks coming in and, and uh, trying to convert the Indians. And This church is actually one of the most recognizable churches in the country, I think. Uh, so we gassed up in Abiquiu, and then we were heading up just to find a camp spot kind of up on the ridge above Abiquiu, and we got onto this really rocky, tough, rutted, steep, loose, gnarly trail. I mean, it was hard. What makes it tough is it's some rock climbs, uh, some steep rock climbs. There's a couple ledges. Um, and some two-track that's barely visible. If you feel like you're able to do that kind of stuff, um, uh, then I absolutely suggest you do it uh, because it, you get up on these high bluffs and you're looking back, back down over Abiquiu and some red uh, kind of rock formations and, and then you're up in the trees. And it's, it's definitely worth it if you're an advanced rider. A few of us actually made it up to the top 
and then had to turn around and go back down when the rest of the team didn't make it. And it was like something out of Africa up there. It was just gorgeous. The lighting was perfect. It was really a bit of a disappointment to, to not stay up there. Uh, but that's going to have to be an expert only option. It's a short piece, but it's just brilliant. If you can get up there, it's fantastic, gorgeous. Uh, but it is just a small piece of that final day. I think as a, as a group, we've kind of decided uh, we're going to take the alternate route, the easier alternate route, uh, which is actually a beautiful route in itself. And then we're going to be at the end, which is I, I'm really excited about. You know, we've been out here for a long time, so uh, uh, and we're all still on our bikes, and we're going to get to the end of this thing. One of the highlights, I think, of the New Mexico BDR is the trip from Abiquiu all the way to the final uh, destination. It's about 123 miles from there out to the end of the route. There are no fuel stops and there are no um, places to uh, get any food. You start climbing up into the pines, then you get up into where you're in the aspen trees, and there were tunnels of aspen trees that we went through that were absolutely stunning and beautiful and you could smell the fall in the air. It was just rolling hills, sort of partially treed, these green meadows, and the road was just this twisty ribbon of, of good grippy dirt. Uh, in many places it wasn't even gravel, it was just this nice dirt. It was cool, we had this blue sky with white clouds going through, it was just, just gorgeous. It goes up into these high meadows where you, you have expansive views you can see for miles. And when we were up there, the wind was blowing and, and it was just like something you'd see in Mongolia with, you know, a lone rider heading across the plains. We got down, crossed a bridge, and then there's a section that follows the river. We um, swept along the Los Pinos River for a few miles and, and down by the river there's huge cottonwoods and aspens that are just, I mean the leaves are just, they're starting to bloom and starting to change and it's just, it's, it's an amazing experience. And you're right along the river and there's cliffs on this side and it's a, just this little road and there's beautiful campsites. If you want to camp at the end of the trip, that's a beautiful campsite. I really uh, didn't expect it to be so good. It's been just gorgeous. I mean, one of the most beautiful forests I think I've ever ridden through and just the sweeping flowy roads where it's been just relaxing. It's not the type of road where you feel like really charging it. It's just been this relaxing. We're kind of riding as a group, talking on the intercoms. It's been awesome. I think it's been the most enjoyable day of the whole, the whole trip. So just when you think it's over, it's not quite over. And there was one final last construction zone. So we blew past the road close signs, found where the actual construction zone was. A couple of us had to fall over. We got our bikes picked up and we made it through. No harm done to us or any of the machines or the road. And that was like our last final obstacle on this BDR. And then from then it was smooth sailing to the finish line. The very end, there's a hairpin right-hander that basically went hairpin and straight up. Like you literally had to claw your way out of New Mexico to Colorado. A little bit of a challenge at the end. I think we'll keep it in the main route. It wasn't uh, expert only type of terrain, but it was definitely uh, challenging and it had a couple of spots that were definitely difficult. Towards the end of the trip, you're in high mountain meadows with large peaks in the background and the Sangre de Cristos in front of you. Relish the last section because I think by far it's the best ending of all the BDRs. And when you get to the top of that hill and you see the border, it's like wow. You know, you've really accomplished something. It was really nice to see that entering Colorado sign and to have, uh, you know, the sixth backcountry discovery route in the books. In the end, it was actually a, a interesting experience, you know, using the motorcycle as therapy. As long as you're careful, it's completely doable. Uh, as a caveat, liability, I cannot say you can do this, do not attempt at home, so to speak, but it worked out. I'm at the end of the ride. I feel better than I did at the beginning. Woohoo! We did it! Yay.
it was a surprising nice. trip. It's actually on, you know, the top BDRs for me, actually, just because of the variety. Um, I think we're ending it on a great note, and uh, that's, I think that you can't beat that. I'm not really ready for this trip to be over. I, this is great. We're in, you know, there's a great camaraderie amongst the group, and um, the road and the riding is awesome. This is kind of our job now. We just throw a leg over the motorcycle every day, and that's, that's your life. 1,267 miles, I heard, was the total distance. So being able to show people a defined route through New Mexico brings people closer to the culture and the heritage and the history that we all know about that live here. Yeah! Oh! <laughs> You ready to go? Yeah, we're we're ready. Well, I've never been to the state of Mexico, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. I hear it's high. New Mexico. Did I say Mexico? Yeah. Ah, shit. What should I talk about? Quiet. And so uh, I uh, went and uh, Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. <laughs> All right, you rolling? All right. So the New Mexico BDR actually starts in Texas, in Dell City. I'll start that over. Fuck, I don't even remember what that was. Down in the South Texas town of El Paso, I fell in love with a slam dancing girl. So we need more brewskis on the BDR. Brewskis and carne asada, hey. What we've inherited now is an English translation of the original song that was written by the aliens that built the pyramids that are buried all over this area. <laughs> okay, so that's totally useful for the film, right? <laughs> this is absolutely not going to be politically correct to put on camera, but that's okay. $5,000 for at the end of this trip, every single person in the group rings out the accumulation of dirt and body sweat, and you have to put it in a glass and drink it. Tax is taken out, so. All right. Oh, you're a messed up guy, buddy. Good morning, I'm Roger Pattison. Take off one of your pairs of glasses so you don't look like an alien bug. Roger Pattison, I think, is passionate about uh, preserving riding and creating riding opportunities in his home state, and it was a great honor for us to have him along for the project. Well, our goal was to ride all of the BDRs. Shao um, was a great addition. All right, yeah, my, um, oh, what was the question? Xiao Marie, she's Wonder Woman. She has a Wonder Woman belt buckle even. I've got one more to go and can't wait to do it. Kevin Woody, this guy I think might be the, the MVP for the backcountry discovery routes this year. Kevin Woody, I have absolutely thoroughly enjoyed having on the trip. It was uh, gut-wrenching for us to see him have to bow out with uh, but even when he was injured, he still had a good attitude. If someone was laughing, it was usually Kevin. <laughs> hey, we all have an opportunity to support uh, the BDR system, and uh, we can do that through membership. Uh, go to the website and uh, sign up and support what we're all trying to accomplish by being a member.